Hi, and welcome to this Seek and Prosper interview series from S&P Global. My name is Nathan Hunt. I am joined today by Tom Devlishauer, who is the Senior Director, Transport and Mobility at S&P Global Mobility. And what we're going to be talking about today is the future of mobility. So, Tom, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, well, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Let's start with mobility as a service. You've written a lot on this topic. Do you feel this is a trend that is as fully developed as it's going to get, or is there more that can be accomplished on this front? A short answer would be yes and no. Uh, it's a very complex topic overall. And, uh, you know, a lot of people still think of, like, obviously, Uber, like, you know, the West, well known, but you have many other, you know, uh, similar companies around the world. You know, we've seen Didi in China, you know, delisting or soon to be delisting in New York. They're no longer effectively startup companies, right? But they still want to portray themselves as that. Been around Uber probably sort of like, you know, for the last 10 years or something already and the model as we know it today. Um, And they're struggling to make money. Uh, You know, they had a good time because they raised huge amounts of capital. Uh, and that made it easy for them because they had to you know, have a buying market share, right? You know, everybody got discount codes for everything and the whole part. Um, and then, of course, the pandemic hit. People stopped using it. And sort of the first real crisis hit that mobility service uh, sector. Uh, and things got very tough. Now, slowly, people are kind of coming back. But, you know, we have a driver shortage, other kind of parts. Waiting times are increasing. Uh, and the realization is there that actually, you know, we need to do something different almost kind of part. And it really sort of like right now they're in a holding position, if you want. What they really need is to reduce their costs further uh, and make it more attractive, um, you know, in the longer term for people. Uh, and that's really where we're looking at that next big step that could potentially unlock sort of that route to profitability uh, is really about sort of these robo taxis, you know, that we're talking about. Uh, but that's going to take a while, I think. So in the meantime, you know, we do expect that, you know, the, um, the performance of these companies, you know, might be, you know, a bit hit and miss sometimes depending which markets. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, that's how it is. Okay, that brings us to driverless cars. I'll confess that based on the early experiments by Waymo and others, I fully expected perhaps naively, I fully expected driverless cars to be everywhere by 2022. Are the barriers technological, cultural, legal? Where to start on this? I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, if you turn that the clock like another five, you know, five, six years ago, I think the whole world was expecting, based on comments from some CEOs in the industry, that, you know, we would all be driving like that now. I think we had a slightly different view on that. Um, and I think it's, um, it's very early days. I mean, technology wise, I mean, these companies involved, they're very clever. They've been working on it for a long time. You mentioned Waymo, there's many others uh, that are involved in it. Um, They are very good at kind of specifically programming vehicles for a very particularly predetermined operating area, you know. Mm. Uh, And that's why you see those driving around, you know, in San Francisco and a couple of other places. Now, if you would take that same vehicle and drop it, you know, like right here in the center of London or in Paris or in, in Delhi, um, those vehicles would struggle to operate down there. So while the technology you know, is, is capable of a lot of great things, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of preparation work. And that's why it's kind of sort of really deployed on a, on a case-by-case situation, you know, depending on different cities, other parts. So there will be quite a bit of delay in there, I suspect, in, in, in the meantime. Um, and then, of course, the other big sort of um, obstacle is, of course, uh, legal issues. Um, uh, the U.S. has been leading this uh, situation quite a bit, and that's just purely because it's a slightly less regulated operating environment, if they, I would say that politically correct. <laughs> um, you know, if there is no laws that tell you what, what you can do, what you can't do in the U.S., anything goes. And all of these startups have really been rushing, putting vehicles out there on the street. Now, slowly, more and more kind of sort of guidances or regulations are starting to roll out to try to control that a little bit more. If you look in here in Europe... In Europe, we're probably the most overregulated region in the world. Um, you know, you can't test these vehicles on the road because you have to wait until there is a rule that tells you what you can do, how you can do it, and where you can do it. So that's why Europe is kind of perceived as like, you know, we're lagging behind. But then the majority of the major European vehicle manufacturers all have tech centers in California. So they're, they're kind of exploiting that opportunity there too. And if you're looking at China as the other kind of big uh, player in here, in China, a lot of things can happen very quickly. 
you know, if they have the full support from the government, and they have for the time being, uh, you know, China wants to be seen to be leading in the world in, in this technology. So there's a, an interesting sort of competition brewing up here between different, you know, geographic regions. Uh, and that can only um, improve the overall outcome of this situation and, and the rollout of these vehicles. To your point about that these cars work very well on a local level, there's a lot of talk about long haul trucking and driverless technologies. Are we getting closer on that front? Well, it's interesting that you raised that, actually, because I think, you know, trucking is sort of like the forgotten sector. But I mean, it's not very sexy, you know, if you want to show off your technology, other kind of part. So uh, most people haven't even, you know, man in the street hasn't even thought about that. Right. Um, but I would say that the, um, the business case there could be significantly greater. Um, you know, if you're looking at it from an economic perspective, I mean, you know, making these deliveries long haul, you know, trucking, you know, d- across the U.S., across Europe. Um, there's a huge benefit that's to be had, you know, uh, improving safety, but also, you know, uh, for in, in many regions, you know, you have, again, legal restrictions in driving time that your driver is allowed to operate. You know, it's typically like, you know, you can maximum, I think, seven to nine hours, depending where you are in the world, do a driving shift. And then you have to stop and you've got to basically spend whatever time is sleeping in the back of your truck or any kind of part. So if you can automate that whole process while you drive on the interstate, long haul, the, the truck can take over, do all of that. And, you know, we, we need, just need a little support from the regulation point of view saying, recognizing that, yeah, we know this portion has been driven by, by the truck. This portion will be driven by, by the operator, by the driver. And, and we can become even more competitive then because that truck could you know, almost be driving, you know, continuously majority of the day. Um, so there is a, there's a huge business case to be made for that. And of course, the biggest benefit is that, you know, on the interstates, on the autobahns of the world, we're all driving in the same direction. We don't have cyclists, we don't have pedestrians. So the operating conditions are so much better for all of it. Uh, and you could still easily do it that the minute you, you, you take the exit, uh, you know, from the interstate, the, the truck driver will take over. So that, that job of a truck driver could change where he's kind of like a supervisor in the meantime, you know, of the technology of all the other parts and then just doing that final driving bit to, to the, the warehouses, depots, other parts. On electric vehicles, it feels like we're reaching some kind of tipping point. Maybe I'm being optimistic here, but Volkswagen announced they are planning to manufacture 800,000 EVs this year. Uh, Tesla continues their march to dominance. GM continues pursuing their view of an EV future. And personally, I've got a lovely Volvo EV that I quite enjoy driving. Uh, is the market for EVs finally hitting its stride? I think definitely we can talk about an inflection point, you know, in, in the EV uh, sector, you know, overall. Um, I mean, it's partly driven uh, by regulation, as many of these things are. Uh, but the regulation is also kind of there because uh, we're all kind of we're making this you know mobility transition particularly from an environmental benefit from climate change perspective. Right. You know, we're all familiar with the, uh, you know, the Paris Climate Agreement. You know, nearly all countries in the world signed up for that. Um, and, you know, it's resonating with the consumers. Uh, you know, we had, during the pandemic, you know, in cities around the world where normally the air quality is not very good, you know, we weren't driving. Suddenly it was nice air quality. We had sunshine. People liked it. You know, hey, we can cycle, we can do other things, you know, safely all too. So people have had a taste for what it could be in the city, you know, being nice and, and all the other parts. So there is more willingness, but what we need now is product, more product offering. Mm. And I mean, there is a big product offering already, and it's just going to increase, you know, for every year now almost. Like, I mean, we're, we're talking about, you know, probably globally, we should have something like, I don't know, between four to 500 different EVs that are available for people to buy. So um, we've definitely hit that inflection point. But, um, you know, in some regions, the pressure is higher. You know, and again, in Europe, with the Green Deal, uh, the push is full on on that. You know, they don't want us to drive an internal combustion engine anymore. What if you're looking at other sort of more developing markets, there's probably going to be sort of intermediate stages uh, within there on, on, on the way to full electrification. Okay, so let's talk about the the bad news here, which yeah. is we're seeing or anticipating shortages and high prices for electrical steel, battery metals, nickel, copper. Uh, do we have the raw materials and manufacturing in place to meet all of these EV goals? It's going to be challenging. 
Yeah, and that's a nice way of putting it, I guess. I mean, we're, we're soon going to get into a very sort of tight supply in the market. I think we've already had a taste of that with, again, the whole supply chain is already out of sync, you know, with the, the pandemic that we've had. Now the lockdowns in China are still, um, you know, the whole distribution chain, shipping, everything is out of sync. So it, it's already, you know, a lot of pressure on the whole wider system. Uh, and then, of course, we have to see um, if we suddenly, you know, that inflection point, you know, it, it is accelerating. We see in volumes increasing. You know, you mentioned Volkswagen, 800,000 that were quoted. Um, eventually, we're going to come at a point where if everybody starts pushing so many EVs out there, you know, we can't supply all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and, you know, I don't want to put an exact date on there, but, you know, let's just say it's probably something like, you know, between now and for the next five to seven years, we will be in a very tight supply market for this. So that puts some of the manufacturers in a slightly difficult position because they have to decide, okay, which markets do we satisfy first? Typically, that will be linked to the regulation part. You know, we have to comply with these emission regulations. So, okay, we definitely have to sell these vehicles uh, in California. You know, we will definitely have to sell them in Europe. But, you know, do we really have to sell them like in, in South America or in Southeast Asia? Probably not. Um, Now, of course, they don't also want to exclude many of these markets. So there are kind of interim solutions, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it could be that we see the majority of the EVs being reserved for those key markets Mm -hmm. and that we start seeing more push of like hybridization uh, technology uh, in other markets to sort of get people used to the fact that, you know, look, this is the beginning of electrification, other part. And of course, there's other issues that we have also, you know, we need to change the mindset of people, right? If you have an EV, most of us, you know, if you have one now, it'll probably be your first one, just as yourself. Um, you're getting worried about where do I charge you now all the other parts. So there's many other issues. So it's, it's a kind of a, a culturally and an emotional journey, you know, for consumers. Um, but I think most have a positive experience with it. All right, Tom, infrastructure is another challenge. Unless you own a Tesla in the United States, driving an EV is a game of connect the dots. Uh, Service stations seem to continue to treat EVs like alien spacecraft, at least in the United States. How is Europe doing on this front? Not too dissimilar, I would argue. Um, you know, I mean, just for, for for the record, I don't drive an EV at this point in time. So, you know, but um, you start to see a lot more charging uh, infrastructure availability, you know, not just Tesla. I mean, Tesla is obviously very obvious. You know, they look very cool, everything, all right. the part. Um, but very quickly, you start seeing, you know, on the key routes, you know, all other kind of key locations, they are popping up. And I think, you know, I'm not too concerned about, you know, uh, yes, it is a limiting factor to some degree. Uh, the biggest limitations that we expect to see is probably like, you know, in, in bigger cities. Uh, you know, if people live in apartment blocks and all other parts, where are they going to charge? You know, that's kind of the big, the biggest issue overall. Uh, so they will have to rely on public charging. Uh, so that's probably still a need that we need to do more there. But from a European perspective, uh, the European Commission has kind of clearly factored that in. Uh, I mean, the way that Europe as a, as a whole is kind of organized is a bit more complex. You know, we have the commission sets kind of targets for all the member states, but then it's up to the member states to how they implement that. So they have completely free reign on that. But at least now it's come to, to kind of a situation where uh, it's being mandated at a European level. And so the member states know their individual targets that they have to meet. So how they do it, it's up to them. Uh, you know, if they fund it, partly fund it, if they bring private money in. Um, but it is, it's moving. It's starting to move. Um, and I think, again, it's also partly to do with that consumer education element from it. You know, people are very worried about it. But in reality, let's face it, you know, I mean, if you drive your average driving on a weekday, uh, on a week maybe itself, you probably have sufficient range to do that with your EV. Um, so once people get comfortable with that and realize that actually, you know, it's not too bad, you know, I don't need it too much. Um, and of course, ultimately, um, you know, it's very, very nice that you are able to recharge your vehicle at home. I mean, you can't refuel your vehicle at home. Right. Um, so that's a big draw there for, for a lot of people, I think, as well. Uh, and, you know, looking forward, you know, a couple more years from now, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see that some vehicle manufacturers might offer uh, a vehicle with a reduced uh, battery capacity because people suddenly get more used to the idea that, you know what, it's actually fine. So the vehicle can also become cheaper to sell. 
Uh, and, you know, we just might charge it a bit more often. But, you know, if we have that capability, why not? So I think, um, you know, slowly but surely uh, that is being addressed. Uh, again, that's different where you are in the world. What about heavy duty vehicles, by which I mean things like, you know, long haul trucks, uh, combines, stuff like that. Can this be, can we, can we electrify these vehicles or should we be looking at alternative fuel sources like hydrogen in a case like this? It's probably going to be a combination of, of all of those <laughs> factors. I mean, again, the, the trucking industry, long haul trucking is an industry that's extremely conservative. You know, even more, you know, much more than compared to, you know, light vehicle uh, manufacturers. Um, so for them, you know, it's it's not like, hey, I really like the look of this truck. I'm going to buy it. It's all, you know, based on economics, <laughs> you know, everything. Can we make this work? How do we make maximum amount of profit? Um, so from that perspective, the EV is attractive because, you know, it's low operating conditions from that. But then you have to think about it also. If I have a really big long haul delivery truck, um, you know, a big uh, heavy truck. Um, in many uh, you know regions around the world, like in Europe, you have weight limitations on there. You have length restrictions on there. So if I want to have one of these you know long haul trucks in Europe, and I want to put a lot of batteries in there that's required, it's going to cost me uh, cargo space or, or weight that you know I can't. I'm not allowed to transport other parts. So there is kind of sort of still quite a lot of issues there. So I think we will see uh, you know pure electric. Um, delivery trucks, but they're probably more in the medium kind of range where they operate. These vehicles, they you know, it, they will have enough range with one charge in most cases for their daily duty cycles. And of course, the benefit is that in the evenings they return to base, they, re they return to their depot. So you know, you can you can the charging is not that much of an issue because you can control it. So there is definitely a portion there for that. But you're absolutely right. If we're looking at the very long haul, um, you know, uh, trucking, um, the diesel engine is still uh, it makes a lot of economic sense at this point, And we expect that to continue for quite some time, actually, into the future. But um, a fuel cell truck, you know, hydrogen uh, fueled uh, starts to make sense at some point in the in the future as well. And uh, we see that most of the leading truck manufacturers are also actually investing a lot of uh, resources in, in developing that technology. Uh, and some of them actually, you know, are actually trialing already today. So, you know, we do expect that there will be sort of like a, a multi-energy solution overall appearing from that. And uh, all of the above will apply. Tom, I have evidently made a mistake. Five years ago, I did not ask for your insights on the future of mobility. So I'm going to ask now for you to look five years in the future. What do you think the major trends will be in terms of mobility? First of all, I think if you're looking at the wider mobility sector, it's actually quite a short amount of time. Right. And particularly if you frame it in the world where we are today, you know, the geopolitical issues, we have all the other parts. So there's a lot of uncertainty in there. But if we start looking first at the certainty, what we do know is that those climate targets are coming, you know, they're nearing closer and closer, and particularly, you know, Europe very dedicated to it. Uh, and, you know, other states in you know, California and, and similarly minded states. So um, electrification will be the top priority for this. So, you know, five years from now, we could walk out of this studio here and we'll have to be very careful when we cross the road because it could be full with silent EVs. And, you know, we might uh, we might even get hit by a car. Um, so that's probably going to be, you know, the biggest change. You know, people will almost find EVs on every corner of the street. Uh, and we'll have a bit more sunshine, maybe, hopefully, fingers crossed, less pollution. So that's a, that's a big, a big good thing that's happening. Uh, a bit beyond that five-year time frame, we'll probably start to have, uh, why not, an electric robo-taxi. Um, you know, so, uh, and that is kind of where it gets really cool for a lot of people, right? Um, but that will be, again, in very specific operating conditions like what we see in San Francisco. But I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if we see a couple in London, you know, in New York, in, in other kind of operating conditions. Um, I think, like, you know, Paris is a great example of a city. If you want to look, what, what what is it going to look like, you know, five, seven years from now? Paris is almost kind of completely changing around, becoming anti-car. And, uh, you know, they're rolling out, you know, all the cycle lanes, all the other parts, public transportation, you know, perfectly operating, very cheap and affordable. Uh, and it, it works, you know. So, I mean, if you would look at Paris today compared to like, you know, five years ago or something, 
uh, it, you wouldn't recognize it almost. So I think there's a lot of um, sort of multimodality in the system that's also going to take over. But if we have, if we make it harder for privately owned vehicles from, from people, you know, that we have to operate in our cities, unless you pay a high charge to enter the city or not, then you also make it much easier for those robo taxis to operate because mm-hmm. there's a lot less risk that we're taking out of there. So it all kind of goes hand in hand, really. And I'm, I'd like to think that, you know, five, seven years from now, uh, we do actually will have safer, uh, more pleasant cities. Uh, and uh, I think that's a good start, you know, and then beyond that, we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, we can look in our crystal ball, but, uh, you know, the, the manufacturers are very good at designing and manufacturing technology and vehicles that could surprise many of us. Tom, with regret, I'm going to have to leave it there for today. But thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us on this Seek and Prosper interview series. Thank you.